So first, what is a primitive? In computing, a primitive is the smallest processing instruction for a given abstraction level. Put simply, you can think of primitives as the simplest building blocks you can give to a user to create something useful. From the user's perspective, there are black boxes that do something you need, but you don't care about the specific details of how. And so they abstract away implementation details. In the context of quantum computing, a high-level user is generally interested in writing quantum algorithms without worrying about hardware details. Based on this, good candidates for primitives have started to emerge. An estimator primitive computes expectation values of observables with respect to states prepared by quantum circuits. If you're hearing about expectation values for the first time, check out this quick primer below. Users generally specify a list of circuits, observables, and possibly some additional configuration with which a program can efficiently evaluate expectation values and variances. The sampler primitive returns shot-by-shot -shot bit strings sampled from the probability distribution of the quantum state prepared on the device. Importantly, while one could use a sampler to compute expectation values, you then might have to implement lots of post-processing yourself that the estimator handles automatically. Conversely, you wouldn't get individual bit strings from the estimator unless you were to break into its internals. But this is fine for many applications in quantum computing. So let's walk through a utility scale example of both the sampler and estimator to see how these primitives simplify quantum computations in practice. The circuits that we'll be using as an example are based on those in IBM Quantum's recent Nature paper, Evidence for the Utility of Quantum Computing Before Fault Tolerance. And in this paper, they study the dynamics of a kicked icing model on 127 qubits. So let's head over to our laptop, look up these circuits, and implement them on the primitives. OK, so the first thing to do is to look up the circuits that we want to run with the primitives. So what I'm going to do is look up the paper now, Evidence for the Utility of Quantum Computing. You can see I've looked it up before. Click on the link here. And so this is the paper released just a few months ago where they do the kicked icing model on 127 qubits and compare it against various classical methods. So what I'm looking for here is the actual circuit that they run. So here you can see the device connectivity is 127 qubits. And it looks like they use this 2D topology. And they have these three layers of gates in between. Um, we might do something a little bit simpler. OK, and here we go. So this is the Hamiltonian that they're implementing. This is a transverse field icing model. Transverse field because they have this x field going in a perpend perpendicular direction from the interactions between the spins that are nearest neighbors, marked by this left and right angle bracket here. And then when you do the first order trotterization, you can see that you get these exponentiated forms here. And then it results in these layers of RZZ gates and these layers of RX gates here. So in terms of a circuit, what this turns into is this here. You can see that we, have, um, we can break down each one of these RZZ interactions into this gate over here. So this is all the information we need, actually, to code up this uh, icing circuit. Is there any other information that we could use here? No. So what the circuit's going to look like, basically, is that we're going to define some connectivity between the qubits. And uh, the nearest neighbors are then going to be connected by these interactions over here. And then we'll have this transverse field being applied to every qubit after each trotter step as well. So let's head over to uh, our um, IDE now. This is the notebook from the last episode. Let me make a new one now. So let's make a new file. Let's call this um, episode four primitives ipy notebook. OK, so the first thing we want to do is map the problem into circuits and operators. What I have in mind now is to show what the sampler can do, which is to collect bit strings. And so what I want to do here is use this circuit as an example for the sampler. And to make it a situation where we care about bit string probabilities, what we're going to do is do this trotterized icing forward in time. And then we're going to do it backwards in time. So we'll apply a unitary u followed by an inverse unitary. And the overall result should be that if we start from some state, in this case, it's going to be the all zero bit string state, we should end at the all zero bit string state. However, because of noise, we might find that this probability changes. And so instead of having all zeros at the end, we might have some other bit strings that come out. And that signals that we have some noise. And this is a quick and dirty way to measure the strength of our noise 
using a circuit that we can later use for some interesting applications. So the first thing we need to do then is code up this circuit. So let's write this here. We're going to be looking at the uh, transverse field icing model to demo primitives. And the first thing we need to do now is to make a circuit that allows us to create this transverse field icing model trotterization. So let's see. What I want to do then is write a function that generates the 1D transverse field icing model circuit. And if we go back to this paper, you can see that the circuit is defined by the number of qubits that we have, the number of trotter steps that we do in total, as well as this angle inside the Rx gate here, which is proportional to or equal to 2H delta T, which relates to the parameters in the Hamiltonian here. So let's make this circuit then. We're going to have num qubits as an input, the number of trotter steps, and then the Rx angle. OK. So what I do is create the quantum circuit. QC equals quantum circuit. And we'll put the num qubits inside here. And then for each uh, trotter step in the total number of trotter steps, I want to add one layer of this 1D transverse field icing model. In this case, I'm doing the 1D model instead of the 2D model in the paper, just because it's a little simpler for implementation. But one could straightforwardly do that as well. I'm going to pass in the quantum circuit, the Rx angle, and that should be it. And then I can just return the quantum circuit. And now I need to write another function here. I need to write the function to add a 1D transfer field icing model trotter layer to the circuit. It's going to take in these inputs that we have here. And see, now we have to consult actually the paper to see what they did. If we look at the paper here, we see that the circuit consists of these layers of RZZ gates between nearest neighbors, followed by RX gates on all the qubits. So we're going to do that first. What I'm going to do is try to compress these gates. Because if you notice that if they're going to be between all the nearest neighbors, if we just did them naively, i equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, we would get this uh, ladder of RZZ gates. And that's not as compressed as it could be. The depth of the circuit is quite large. And we might find that there's more noise from the idle times. So a more efficient way to do it is to do it by layers. And that's actually what this figure is showing here, is they show in the 2D case, there are three unique layers you can create, those colored by red, blue, and green. In the 1D case, you can see how there, there's only two layers, those between qubits 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then those between qubits 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. So I'll call those the even and odd layers just because the even layers, the first index is an even number, and in the odd layer, the first index is an odd number. So let me code that here. First, let's write the code for adding the RZZ gates between in the even layers. So for i in range 0 and then qc.num qubits minus 1, 2, we want to add the RZZ gates. Um, one other thing that might be helpful later on is that you can see here that the RZZ gate, RZZ gate can actually be broken into these gates here. So this s dagger, s dagger, followed by a root y, a c naught, and then a root y inverse. And so I'll just use those as well um, and break it up. Maybe it'll help the transpiler later on to merge these gates together. So what I'll do is qc.sdg, that stands for s dagger. And I'm going to apply it on qubits i and i plus 1. Because in this case, uh, we're applying to both qubits in a given qubit pair. And then I want to do qc.append sy gate, I think, and apply that onto qubit i plus 1. Then I'll do the C naught gate that the paper says to do between i and i plus 1, followed by the sy dagger gate on uh, qubit i plus 1 yet again. So that should match what goes on here. And if you look carefully, you'll see that this sy gate has this yellow line underneath it. In my particular IDE, that means that is not defined. 
And so what this is telling me is that, well, first I need to import as all these packages and gates that I haven't done so far. So let me do that first. From Qiskit import quantum circuit, and then from qiskit.circuit uh, library, let's see if we can import the SY gate. No, we don't have that. So we do have the SX gate, but we don't have the SY gate. So instead, what I will do is create my own SY gate. What, uh, so I can import the Y gate and then this generic unitary gate that allows me to create new unitary gates. So I'll write the SY gate as the unitary gate. And it's going to be the Y gate to the square root. And I'll label this as this. So it's going to be, yes, this square root y. Yep. And I want to do the same thing for the inverse. So in this case, the sy dagger gate will simply be the unitary gate of the inverse of the y gate. So I'll take this sy gate dot inverse. And I'll do the square root and put to the dagger here. Okay. So now what I've done is basically define my own custom gates because they weren't originally available in this Qiskit circuit library. And I'll go back to coding up the circuit now. Okay, so that's RZZ in the even layers. I can do the same thing in the odd layers now by just starting this from one and then going all the way up to the same exact value. And then the final thing to do is to apply this RX gate onto all the qubits. So I'll do the same here now. So qc.rx, and let's apply the rx angle for all of the qubits in the circuit. All right, and that should be it. Let's make sure that this came out correctly by writing a quick test here. So let's say the number of qubits equals six. We'll set the number of Trotter steps to one for now. And then let's set the Rx angle to, let's say 0 0.5 times not, uh, pi. Oh, I need to import NumPy. Let's get the circuit using our new function by passing in num qubits, the num trotter steps, and the Rx angle. Okay, that's it. And then let's draw it, qc.draw. I'll put again MPL to make it look pretty. Um, it might be a long circuit, so it's fold equals minus one, so it's all on one line. And tr let's try this function out. Okay, that ran just fine. And let's hit enter here to see how it looks. Okay, so there we go. We can see we have the six qubit circuit, and we're assuming they're all connected nearest neighbor into a 1D chain. And we've got the S dagger gates on all qubits, followed by the square root of Y followed by the C knots between pairs, followed by the square root of Y inverse, and then followed by the same thing on the odd layers here. And then we have an RX gate applied to each one. This visualization is a little bit confusing. So why don't I throw in an extra uh, keyword here that allows me to put in barriers if I would like. So let's call this, um, Let's have two kinds. Let's have whether we have barriers between the even and odd layers. And then let's have barriers that are between the different trotter steps. So we'll say trotter barriers, default to false, and the layer barriers, default to false as well. And now what we can do is after each trotter step, if trotter barriers is true, then we can add a barrier. And then in this case, um, for the layer barriers, why don't we pass this in as well and make this an optional keyword here. And if the layer barrier is true, then we'll add a barrier between each layer, again, just for visualization purposes. So if layer barriers, qc.barrier, if layer barriers, qc.barrier, and finally, one more time at the end if layer barriers, qc.barrier. Okay, run this again. Let's pass in 
uh, layer barriers, oh, trotter barriers equals true, and layer barriers also equals true. Okay, so this is a lot clearer to see now. Um, so these are the gates exactly as shown here for each RZZ decomposition on the even layers, in the even layer, followed by the same thing in the odd layer, followed by this RX gate. Now I can set trotter steps to two, for example, and we can see what happens now. Now we get this circuit followed by the exact same thing again. So it looks like we have the circuit now to generate the one dimensional transverse field trotterized icing model. Okay, the next thing to do, let's start going into implementing this for the sampler. So demo sampler. And like I said before, for the sampler, I'm interested in showing how we can collect information on a bit string by bit string level. And so what I want to do is plot the probability of having the all zero bit string after we run the circuit forwards and then backwards. So far I've coded the circuit going forwards and now we need to do the same thing for the circuit going backwards. So let me do that, write that up really quick as well here. Okay, so there is probably a smart way to do this in which I can take each instruction in a given circuit and just invert it. But for the sake of clarity, what I'll do is actually just create a function that makes the circuit, but the inverse from right to left. And so the most straightforward way to do this might be to just copy and paste all this information here and then just rewrite it. So generate mirrored 1D transverse field icing model circuit. And we probably also want to make this an in place type method where we pass in a circuit and it doesn't return a new circuit, but it just adds gates to the circuit itself. So we'll call this append mirrored 1D transverse field icing model circuit. It'll take as an input the quantum circuit and it'll take the same exact information as before. Okay. So in this case, we don't need to redefine the quantum circuit. And then for each trotter step in the range number of trotter steps, we want to add the mirrored 1D transverse field icing model trotter layer. And we need to make a function for that as well. Add mirrored 1D TFIM trotter layer. In this case, what we're going to do is uh, do this first. So we're going to add all the single qubit RX gates first. And to invert it, it's as simple as setting the angle to the negative sign. So we'll do that here. And then we'll uh, want to add the RZZ to all the odd layers. So we'll copy and paste this and add it over here. And we're going to want to invert all of these gates over here. So this should be pretty straightforward because we know that the inverse of the SY dagger gate is simply the SY gate. Then we can append the, uh, the C not gate, which is its own inverse. Then we'll go backwards and take care of this line, SY dagger gate. And then finally, we'll invert uh, this S dagger with an S gate. Oh, sorry, we don't need this last one. And then we can do this exact same thing for the even layers. And it might be more straightforward just to co copy and paste this line here and then change this to starting from zero, making sure we continue to add the layer barriers if we would like. And that should be it. So what I've done is just rewritten this function by taking the old one and now it should mirror everything. Let's check to see that this all makes, oops, all makes sense by doing this. So now what we can do is take our original quantum circuit from above and we can say QC mirrored equals append mirrored. Oh, we don't even need to return this actually because we're just adding it directly. We'll just do append mirrored 1D transverse field IC model circuit to QC and then pass in all the same variables as before. Nums trotter steps, the RX angle and the same exact keywords is for trotter barriers equals true, layer barriers equals true. And now let's see what the 
new circuit looks like. QC dot draw output equals MPL fold equals minus one. And let's make the number of trotter steps back to one so the circuit doesn't get too long. See how this looks. Okay, cool. So yeah, it looks like the circuit was inverted properly. Again, this is the original forward direction. We'll call this U uh, for just generic unitary. And then you can see the inverse is over here where we have the RX has a negative angle. So this should turn into identity. And then we have this square root of Y dagger that's inverted by this. This C naught inverts itself. Square root of Y dagger inverts the square root of Y here. These S gates invert the S dagger. The exact same thing happens in this even layer. And so for overall, the, the result of the circuit should be that it turns into the identity. And so if you start with the all zero state on the left side here, we would expect to see the all zero state on the right side as well. Okay, so with this done now, what we can do is start to follow the steps from the Kiskit patterns. And remember, this is steps one, two, three, four, map the problem to circuits and observables, optimize the circuit, uh, execute it on hardware, and finally, look at the post-processed results. So let's do that now. Um, let's create the circuits and the observables that we're interested in. So step one, um, let's map the problem to circuits and observables. And what the problem is again is we're looking at the effect of noise as we increase the depth of the circuit. And so logically what we want to do is increase the number of trotter steps in this circuit while inverting it at every single step and seeing the survivability or the survival probability of the all zero bit string. So let's say that we want the maximum number of trotter steps to be 10, the number of qubits to be 100 to make this at the utility scale. And let's say that we're interested in the survivability of the all zero bit string for the middle two qubits. So let's say that we're going to measure these qubits uh, 49 and 50 over here. So then for each trotter step um, in the range of max trotter steps, what we're going to do is create a quantum circuit list like so. So we'll do QC equals generate 1D transverse field icing model circuit, pass in the number of qubits as before. Actually, I can just copy and paste this entire line. Just take that. Yep. And then what I can do is mirror the circuit. So that would be the exact same line as here. And then what I want to do is measure on just two qubits. So I'll take this qc.measure, and I will measure on the measured qubits that we input above and assign it to the classical registers 0 and 1. And so I need to actually define that now and then add this to the QC list. So what I realized I forgot to do is to make sure that these quantum circuits have classical registers in them. And so I'll just go to my original function I, des I designed up here and then put in something that says like the number of classical bits, let's say. And then make sure that when I instantiate this circuit that I am indeed adding classical bits, num classical bits here. Uh, to make this cleaner, why don't I say if num classical bits equals zero, we'll just create the quantum circuit without a classical register. And if not, then I will make sure it has a classical register. I think that should take care of this. Make sure it all runs again. All right. Index 49 is out of range for size 6. Ah, that's because I didn't redefine the number of qubits that I want. So, oh, OK, because I forgot to assign it to QC. No, oh, still doesn't work. Index 0 is out of range for 0. Hmm, what's going on here? I forgot to pass the number of classical bits into this. so. Yeah, that goes here. So num classical bits equals the length 
of measured bits. That's it. I never created the classical bit register. Oh, measured qubits. OK, so this should work better now. Just to make sure, why don't we visualize what the very, the f what it looks like for the first trotter step? QC list at one dot draw, same as before. This might take a while because this is 100 qubits actually. So let me stop this and redo this with a smaller circuit, same size as before. We'll say size eight on qubits four and five in the middle. And then try it again. OK, so you can see we have the circuit going forwards, backwards, just like before. Now we have the measurements appended on these middle two qubits over here. OK, so now we can just change this back to 100. And I'm fairly confident this will work now. And we won't draw it this time. Just make sure it's running. Oh. But we wanted this to be flexible for the number of classical bits. So list, range, length, measured qubits. Great. OK, so that's step one. Step two is now going to be optimized. And you can see how straight, oops. You should be able to see how straightforward this is following a similar workflow as we had before. So call it step two, optimize. OK. So just like before, let's do from Kiske import. Um, this time, I'll just use the generic transpile function instead of the preset pass manager. From Kiskit IBM runtime, import Kiskit runtime service. We're again going to be using IBM Brisbane service. Oops. And then instantiate the service. And call the backend. And now let's do the transpilation for each of these circuits. Transpile, QC list, backend equals backend, and set the optimization level just to one this time. Done instantiating. Since done getting the backend. Ah, typo. Optimization level equals one. Okay. OK, we've gotten the back end now. We're transpiling 10 circuits on 100 qubits that probably have thousands of gates. It should only take a few seconds. All right, so that was 10 circuits and something like 40 seconds total, of which 10 of it was just getting the back end. And now let's go to the next step. That's taken care of. Let's execute on hardware. And this follows the exact same process as before, except now we're using the sampler primitive. So from Kiskit IBM runtime, let's import the new V2 sampler that makes submitting things a lot easier and a lot more intuitive. And then we'll import sampler options as well. The sampler options so we can fine tune the performance of our particular run. And so in this case, I'll instantiate the sampler by passing in the back end. And then I'll change the options. Oh, I actually don't need this line at all. Then I will just change. Yes, I'll change the options like this, sampler.options. In this case, because I think there's going to be a decent amount of idle time yet again, I'm going to turn on dynamically decoupling. And I'll also make sure I set the type of dynamical decoupling. X, Y, 4, just like before. And that's all I need to do to set up this run. So then I can just execute by doing sampler.run, sending in my list of circuits. It should return a job. And we're going to print this job ID. Uh, keep it simple. Oh, typo there. Dynamical decoupling. Ah, job dot job ID. Job dot job ID method. 
Sometimes you just have to guess around. Okay, so that's the job ID. Let's go over to our IBM Quantum website now to take a look at it. See if it's popped up in the queue. Okay, there it is. You can see I just ran it a few times trying to get the job ID working, but it went three times out. This is the one that finally we're going to run. Um, these two I don't need, but leave them there anyway. And so this will take some time to run. It's queued up right now and it hasn't told me. Okay, so the wait is going to be about seven hours because right, it's a pretty good device. And it's got quite a long queue. So instead, I'm just going to pull up the results for the job that I ran just before this with the exact same settings. So we can just take a look at how the results are and then the, how the post-processing should be done in step four, post-processing and plotting. Okay. So, okay, well, let's first set up and let's get all the values out first. Let's get the job ID. This is the one that I ran before that worked. Um, we have the service set up already, so I can just do the job equals service.job and pass in the job ID. And in this case, what I'm interested in is the survival probability of the all zero bit string. And so I'm going to try to extract that out from, from the results here. Survival probability list. And then so for each trotter step in the max trotter steps, I'm going to try to get the data out, job.result for at that particular trotter step where there's going to be a different result for each circuit that I passed in, get the data out overall. And to the survival probability list, I'm going to append um, the counts for the bit string that has the all zeros in it. So it's gonna look like this in this case or actually rather zero times the length of the measured qubits. And I'm going to divide that by the total number of shots, because that'll then tell me the survival probability list, the, the survival probability. And I'm gonna have this accept statement because you might find that as noise is really, really large that we actually get no bit strings that have the all zeros in it. And so then if there's some exception that pops up because uh, there's no, they couldn't get the result that had the all zero bit string, then we'll just append uh, zero in that case. That means the survival probability is zero. Okay, so let's run that. And in the meantime, let's get the code ready to do the plotting here. Oops. That's plot. And let's plot this. Plot dot plot. Um, let's make this the x-axis, the depth of the two qubit gates. If you notice that every trotter step has a two qubit depth of four, there's two C naught gates of depth in the even layers, a C naught depth of two in the odd layers. So we'll set this to the range of zero to four times the max trotter steps in steps of four. So this should output um, 0, 4, 8, 12, et cetera, for every trotter step. And then we'll plot on the y-axis, the survival probability list, and give it some markers to visualize. On the x-axis, we'll call this the two qubit gate depth. And then on the y-axis, let's call this the survival probability, um, survival probability of the all zero bit string. And then let's also make some x ticks. 0, 44, 4. Okay. And show it. So there we go. We have the results from the sampler. You can see we, while mapping this problem to the circuit was quite a few lines to just build it up from scratch from the paper. It turns out the workflow itself is quite straightforward. Making the circuits, once you have the code to make the circuits, optimizing is just a few lines. Executing is just a few lines with a few simple options you can toggle on and off. And finally, we've done the post-processing and plotted it. And that's the result here. You can see as the two qubit gate depth increases all the way up to 40, this is a total number of trotter steps of 10, which corresponds to a total number of CNOT gates of around 1,000 on these 100 qubit circuits. You can see that the survival probability starts from one and then drops down close to 0.2 at this level with a little spike over here.
And so we're seeing the effects of noise as the circuit increases because remember, we know theoretically that this should remain at one if we were to have perfect, uh, a perfect quantum computer without any noise. But here, using very, very minimal toggling of the options, just turning on some dynamically decoupling, uh, you can see that the results we get here are pretty high quality already on this utility scale quantum circuit. So the next thing I'm going to do after this is now show you how we can do uh, a similar workflow, but this time using the estimator to get expectation values out. So let's make a new section in this notebook for doing that. So here we're going to do the estimator. And in this case, I want to mimic a result that I saw in the paper that I found pretty interesting. It's in one of the later figures here where they show that as you change the Rx angle for this observable, this magnetization here, this MZ, which is I think the sum over all the Z operators across the circuit, or maybe just a single one, um, you can see that as the Rx starts from zero and goes to pi over two, that this curve goes from one and then drops over there. And I'm curious to see if I can get a similar result out from using the estimator right now on this 1D circuit. So to do that, first I need to start with step one, which is going to be mapping the problem. And in this case, the estimator has powerful functionality uh, and also the sampler, has, they have powerful functionality that allow you to parameterize certain gates or input parameters and then sweep over them without having to generate a circuit for each one of those. And I'm going to show that functionality right here. So what we're going to do is use this parameter object here. And we're going to say that the Rx angle is a parameter that we can vary. We're going to call it the Rx angle as a string. And now what we're going to do is generate the 1D transverse field icing model circuit um, for some number of trotter steps and the Rx angle from before. And then we're going to also now, so that's, that's the quantum circuit here. I'll set the trotter steps equals to two, just to see what happens to this expectation value after two trotter steps. And um, for this circuit that goes out to two trotter steps, we're gonna sweep over the Rx angle and then measure the magnetization. In this case, the magnetization uh, is going to be not of the average over all the single qubits uh, Z operators, but let's just look at the single Z expectation value of the middle qubit. So let's map this into operators now from info. Let's import spouse, sparse polyop. The middle index is going to be uh, the number of qubits backslash backslash two. And then the observable is going to be the sparse polyop. And we're going to do identities up until the point of this middle index. We're going to add the Z operator right there. And then we're going to add identity operators for the rest of them. OK. Rx angle. Um, oops. Yes, I needed to find trotter steps here. OK. So that's taken care of. Now let's go on to step two. Step two, which is optimize the circuit. And I'm going to do the same exact thing as before as in the hello world example. So we can just kind of fast forward through this part here. I will do from Qiskit import transpile from Qiskit IBM runtime import Qiskit runtime service. And yet again, we're going to set the backend. We're going to instantiate the service. And we're going to actually get the backend from the service so that we can do the transpilation. Okay, QC transpiled will be the output of the transpile function where we pass in the quantum circuit, pass in the back end, and set the optimization level, in this case, just to one. Now we need to make sure the observables are also in the right format by applying this the layout of the transpiled circuit, like that. And now that's done too.
Step three, let's execute on quantum hardware. And this time, to do the execution, the one thing that's different from before is we need to define the range of values that the parameter can have. So after first setting up the estimator and the options, or importing them, let's um, define the range of Rx angles of interest. So let's say that we'll start from zero. We want to go up to pi over two. And let's say we want to look at 12 of them in total in this range for Trotter steps equals two and the Rx angle list. Oh, we don't need this number of Trotter steps. The Rx angle list equals np.lin space min Rx angle max Rx angle and the total number of angles. Okay. Now let's define the options for the estimator. In this case, I'm just going to set the resilience level to one, just like before. This invokes little overhead, but takes care of the, any sort of um, readout measurement uh, measurement errors. And then we're also going to turn on the dynamical decoupling to help us get rid of errors during idle times. Let's instantiate the estimator using these inputs of the backend and the options. Just to make sure that we pass in that correctly. And then finally, let's do the run. The input here is going to be this pub format in which we just passed the single tr uh, circuit that we've transpiled at this point. That's only one circuit that's going in, but it has a parameterized Rx value. We'll pass in the observables that we want. In this case, it's just one. And then we'll pass in the Rx angle list. This will be the angles that we sweep over within the parameterized Rx angle. And all this documentation for the input format for these V2 primitives is on, is on the documentation website. And here, we're just passing them in as a single tuple, as you can see. Now let's print the job, that job ID like before. Just make sure that everything has gone through. Ah, it's not resilience options, it's resilience level. That's a typo, let's try it again. And the job's been submitted. So here's the job ID. Again, we can go to the IBM Quantum Platform, make sure that it's gone through. Yep, and there's a job we just submitted, it's queued up right now. So go to step four now post-processing and plotting. And like before, because there's going to be a bit of a time, uh, some time to wait for the job to go through the queue, I'm just going to pull up a job ID for the exact same settings and everything that I just coded up. And I'll paste it here. So we have this job ID equals this. And let's get the job now. In this case, getting expectation values is pretty straightforward. We'll get the expectation value list as job.result and print out the expectation values and make a quick plot to show the Rx angles. And I want to make it look a little bit nicer, so I'm going to normalize it by pi. On the Y list, we're going to have expectation value list, and we'll have this particular output format. On the X labels, we're going to do the uh, Rx angle, angle in units of pi. And in the Y label, we will look at the um, the expectation value of the single Z operator in the middle of the chain. And then let's set the y limits to negative 0 0.1 to 1.1 for plotting. And take a look at the results. Ah, oh, OK. 
something about, oh, this is our X angle list. Yeah, the dimensionality was wrong. Okay, and so you can see here what we have is the plot from 0 to 0 0.5 pi. And remember, what I was hoping to get is something that looked like this. It starts at 1 and goes to 0. And it looks like we have something like that, actually. So we start close to 1, and we go towards 0 as, we have, as the Rx angle equals pi over 2. Of course, this is going to be a little bit different because in that experiment, they go to a significantly higher depth of 5 trotter steps. It's also on a 2D topology, whereas we have the 1D. But, you know, intuitively speaking, I would expect something close to this. And that's exactly what we got. Starts at 1 and goes to 0. And from this point, what we could do is we can increase the trotter steps. We could change the topology to make it more non-trivial from a physics perspective. Uh, there's a lot of room to explore here to explore you know, interesting physics of this particular system. So I think for a physicist, for someone ex uh, looking at materials or chemistry, um, this is a really exciting time to be in because now we're looking at these 100 qubit circuits and getting results that are um, competitive in some cases with classical hardware. So in this video, we showed how access to quantum hardware is simplified with primitives, a fundamental feature of Qiskit 1. We looked at samplers and estimators with examples inspired by IBM's recent Nature paper, showing evidence of the utility of quantum computing before fault tolerance. I encourage you to explore different error suppression and mitigation techniques to see if you can do even more interesting, complex calculations on quantum computers with over 100 qubits. Our next stop will be programming dynamic circuits, a powerful technique in quantum computation recently enabled in Qiskit 1 and available in IBM's quantum computers. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe, and see you next time.